Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Is everybody hearing me okay in the back? Good evening. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Sid Taffer, and I'll be your moderator this evening for the mayoral debate. I'd like to thank the Fairfield Gonzales Community Association, the Rockland Neighborhood Association, and the Sir James Douglas Parent Advisory Council for organizing and sponsoring this event. I'd also like to acknowledge this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. A special welcome to our candidates. Thank you so much. We appreciate all your efforts and sacrifices in seeking to serve us as mayor of our city. Thank you. I'm just going to discuss the format uh, for this evening's event, question and answer period with the, mayor, with the mayoralty candidates. All the candidates will initially be asked an introductory question about their top priority for the city of Victoria, and then the floor will be open to questions from our audience. After the opening round of questions from the floor, we'll ask our community participants to hold their positions, and we'll invite the candidates to respond to two specific questions that have been posed by our community associations. That'll come a little later. And then later in the program, if we have time, and we hope we will, we're going to invite the candidates to ask questions of each other. So do stick around for this. I think that, that should be interesting, something we've never done before. Our, prior, our priority, of course, is questions from the community, but we hope to have this one-on-one -on -one discussion among candidates towards the end of the meeting. Our candidates will be timed by our timer, Blair Humphrey, sitting in the front there. <coughs> and ask to limit their answers to 60 seconds. Supplemental answers or rebuttals from candidates are 30 seconds. And Blair will raise a yellow card to give a 10 second warning and then ring a bell when the time is up. Right. I'm, sure we'll have, I'm sure we'll have the candidates uh, support in these uh, guidelines. And uh, we've got uh, John in the back there who will kind of be our mic monitor for, uh, mic monitor for the candidates. And we have Mark Hunter, we'll introduce him in a minute and what he's going to be doing as a mic monitor for the community participants. We're going to initially start, go from left to right, alphabetically, and then we will vary that up to make it fair later on when we ask other, these are kind of specific questions coming from the communities. So the first question, starting from the left uh, with Stephen Andrew, uh, we'd like to ask the candidate to tell us what they believe is the city's number one priority and how you would handle it as mayor. And for this question, all candidates will be invited to respond. And of course, there'll be no supplemental because every candidate gets a chance to say his or her piece. Stephen, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, another safety announcement. Uh, Flotations, devices. This is this is going to be the process. This committee okay. decided on this process. So we'll start uh, Stephen's time again, please. Good. Uh, my number one priority for the city is that we start to govern with balance. So we deal with our social issues along with the issues that we have for our residents and the people that come and live, work and play in our city along with business. I think far too often that we have been favoring one side. Uh, you will hear the mayor talk today about not leaving anybody behind. I believe that needs to be a global vision so we leave nobody behind. I believe that we need to deal with our social issues from the point of view of uh, dealing with the uh, the issues first, and as uh, you may know, I've set up, um, I want to set up a task force the first 90 days to do. Go ahead. Okay. It's, we're just trying to, <laughs> how's that? Okay. I wear hearing aids and I can't hear anything when you do that. How's that? Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, I do apologize. Uh, I would like to set up a task force in the first 90 days so that we have a situation where we can deal with addiction and recovery and also I have asked that uh, we uh, set up uh, a correctional, uh, take the bank around youth correctional center and create uh, a treatment and recovery center in View Royal that would provide 65 beds and allow us to uh, 
deal with those issues. Thank you. One in five children and one in two children of single mothers in Victoria, that's more than half of children, uh, children of single mothers in Victoria, live in poverty. And Changes wants people to join him in uh, calling for something to be done about this. Um, uh, Changes the Clown believes that as the capital city of the province with the highest rate of child poverty year after year, uh, the city of Victoria should demonstrate how this unacknowledged social crisis in our midst can be addressed at the municipal level despite the fact that it uh, formally falls under provincial and not municipal jurisdiction. Um, the two main platform planks that we're promoting are an affordable child care program, similar to the one that's being plan currently being planned in the city of Vancouver, and a living wage policy like the one that's been in place in New Westminster uh, since 2010. Good evening, everyone. Well, I do believe that the main issue facing Victoria is one of fiscal responsibility and of leadership. In terms of fiscal responsibility, I am very concerned that the property, te property tax rates have increased 34% in the past six years. That is simply not fair for homeowners, for renters, for seniors, and even for small business owners downtown Victoria where the property taxes are passed down to them through their triple uh, uh, net uh, rent leases that uh, they have to sign on to. Inflation has increased over that same period of time less than 9%. So you do the, the equation, the math, doesn't add up. So fiscal responsibility is a critical, uh, fundamental part of leadership going forward. And on the leadership issue, what I'm also concerned about is the Blue Bridge project and I know I'll get a chance to talk to you about that a little bit more. I'm not pleased where we are headed and with that. Thank you. Thank you very much and I appreciate the opportunity to share this evening with you. My name is Dean Fulton and I have the privilege of being here in the city of Victoria. I don't think that there's, quote, a single issue, uh, and I hope that you will see the broad range of issues. Fundamentally, it's about building a sustainable city, one that is uh, involved in the economy, one that's looking at the environment, and one is that we're looking at social justice issues. We have moved forward on those issues that are important to you, affordable housing, transportation, and making sure that you have a safe and vibrant downtown. And in the next four years, we will continue to look at economic growth, We'll invest in needed community infrastructure and in housing, and we'll protect our unique and natural environment. Over the last six years, we have brought property tax increases down every single year. And this year, we are ability to bring in the lowest property tax increase in 14 years. And next year will be even better. Thank you very much. I look forward to the opportunity to dive in more depth on some of the things we want to see as we move forward in the next four years. Pleasure. Thank you very much and good evening. I'm Lisa Helps and I would like to be your mayor. Um, hard to name a number one issue, but if I had to, I would pick accountability. We are your city government. We are tasked with the enormous responsibility of spending your money, of making good decisions on your behalf, and number three, of listening to you. So we're going to talk about a lot of issues tonight. And for me, those are really the important ones. Because if we're accountable to you, if we listen to you, and if we treat your money as if it were our own money, we can solve all of the problems that we're facing. Affordability is a number one concern. I hear from seniors that they don't want to be taxed out of their homes. And I hear from 25-year-olds that they don't want to have to move to Alberta to find a well-paying job. Accountability and listening to you. Those are the qualities that I believe that you need your city hall and your mayor to bring to you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Ross and I uh, got into this uh, about around the last election and started bringing my cameras around and recording processes like this. Um, and I think the biggest issue facing the city is the electoral process itself. 
Um, I don't think this format really best identifies the people who are best suited to run the city. Um, sitting up here and answering a bunch of individual questions and just stating your position is not what the mayor does. The mayor runs the council. The mayor is the one who makes sure that all the details are gone over, makes sure that there's uh, accountability and transparency and that it's good conversation. And it also makes sure that the public is invited and, and welcomed into the, into the environment. And I don't think just this actually identifies who's best to run this city. So I would change how this works. I would make tests that would basically simulations to get people to actually make sure they can actually run, for instance, uh, doing development plan, doing an example development plan or doing a, a uh, land use plan. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to open the floor to questions from our community and uh, our microphone monitor, uh, Mark Hunter, is here at the back with the microphone, the portable microphone. And uh, there are quite a number of people in this room uh, and I'm sure many people have questions so we're going to have to move it along and and have limited answers. I can't. I don't think we can manage answers from the entire panel for every question. And so uh, we have a committee to discuss this process. We knew we'd have a good turnout. And uh, we're going to have to let. We're going to ask. Uh, first of all, I'm going to address the candidates and, and, and tell them again they have 60 seconds to respond to a question. But in this case, we're also going to allow a 30-second follow-up answer to, to a question from the candidate. And once again, follow-ups will be offered to candidates in alphabetical order, starting from the left. Uh, and the candidate can choose to pass their turn, and the follow-up will be offered to the next candidate. It just seems to be the fairest way to do that. And as far as the uh, participants go, in the interest of timeliness, we would ask people to direct their question to a single candidate, and also to refrain from asking the question that's already been posed. That's probably obvious. And of course, we all recognize only candidates running for office give speeches. So we ask you to limit your preamble, if there is one, to your question to a brief one sentence explanation. Uh, so there's uh, uh, Mark Hunter, our microphone monitor, and he'll help ensure this process works effectively throughout the evening. So whoever would like to, we're going to form a line behind Mark. And you can ask your question to an individual candidate, please. A uh, question for Ida Chung. Uh, how exactly are you going to look after the Blue Bridge, as you say in your advert, when there's 79 million odd um, required by the uh, contractor at the present moment without a breach of contract and therefore and more money uh, asked of us taxpayers? Uh, thank you very much. And, you know, the Blue Bridge project has certainly been one of, a, I would say, financial disaster from the very beginning. Because it was presented to all of you at $63 million at the very start of it. Uh, a $77 million budget was then provided and eventually approved at $92.8 million. What I've said to people on the doorsteps, and I'm going to say to all of you, I cannot change the $92.8 million that has been committed to. What I'm concerned about, based on an independent engineer's report, that there is another 11 to 17 million probable potential costs around the corner. And what I'm prepared to do as your mayor is to work hard to get the project completed at the least additional cost that will be there. There will be additional costs. I, I believe it based on the change orders that have been submitted. The question is, will the mayor take charge because the Huckett report that was independently done said no one was in charge. Stephen, would you like to reply? Strategically, I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to go. Changes, would you like to reply to that particular question? Uh, changes will pass. Mr. Ford, would you like to reply to that? Thank you. Thank you very much. And it is nice to have people put in a variety of uh, opinions, but I just want to throw out some facts. We went to a referendum asking for your approval to borrow $49 million on a $77 million bridge. We received $21 million in funding from the federal government. We remain disappointed today that we did not get matching funding from the provincial government. 
that's $21 million, that is approved by the local MLA to be matched. And when Ida Chong had an opportunity to stand up for Victorians, she didn't, and she couldn't deliver. It was a two-year process, and over that two-year process, the budget rose to 92.8. And we went back to the federal government, and we got another $17.5 million. And we currently have $37.5 million coming from the federal government, and we are still borrowing 49. And I will say this, a contract is a contract. When that number went up, we made sure that we moved forward with something that was locked down, a fixed price contract, and I'm holding the line, and I'm not going to give your money away, because that's my money too. Uh, next question, please. Oh, it's, it's, uh, oh, 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 um, my take on the Blue Bridge, many of you, probably all of you are aware that I voted against awarding the contract when we did because the design was only 60% complete and the contingency budget was too small. Going forward, I believe that I am best positioned of any of the candidates up here to take leadership on the project. I've sat at that table for the last three years. I've asked tough questions. I understand the issues. I understand the players. And I, like Ida, am committed to working to get this project done on close to, on as close to the budget as possible, and on time as much as possible. But I have seen every single move of this project firsthand, and I've spoken very loudly and asked, I don't know how loud, but very, very tough questions to give us, to give you the information that we have. The biggest heartbreak at this moment is that we can't tell you for sure how much this bridge is going to cost or when it's going to be done. What we need on this project going forward is leadership and somebody who's been there and walked alongside this project from its inception. Uh, the Johnson Street Bridge is actually the main issue that got me interested in the city in the first place. Um, the referendum that came out had a nice glossy piece of paper that didn't really tell you the details of what the decision really was. Uh, and it presented a picture of the rusty old bridge that wasn't properly maintained. And to ask you to choose between that and this lovely new shiny bridge. And this paint on that bridge is structural. If you don't paint the bridge, the, when they manufactured the bridge originally, they couldn't make plates thick enough. So they took smaller plates and welded them together. And the paint act, acted as a sealant around the bridge to make sure that it didn't rust through. Well, when we stop painting this thing, and he's still rusting out there right now, it's falling apart. And no wonder we have to replace it now. But it's details like that that this council has not really paid attention to, that I'd like to pay attention to every single detail of important infrastructure projects like this. We all have to have a say on this. Well, bottom line is, you've been asking questions about this bridge. You've told, pick a bridge. No, you picked the wrong bridge. This is the bridge we're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. And that design has been changed over the time. We heard about the moral authority on the bridge. Quite simply, Lisa doesn't have that moral authority. She sat at the table for three years. And still after three years, she even says on her website, she didn't know who was in charge. And it took a, a consultant's report to bring that back. The mayor will not admit that for the past three years, he's been saying $92.8 million. It's a fixed price bridge. And it's going to be on time. Well, we now know from two reports, it's not going to be on time. And it's not going to be on budget. And ladies and gentlemen, despite what the mayor says, I'm not going to give you money away. You know I can be a hard nut, and I'm going to hold everyone to that contract and ensure that we get the lowest price possible with the deal that we have before us. And that is my pledge to you. I will not waste your money. Well, it's all about the bridge. <laughs> uh, question for 
counselor helps. Um, I'm hoping the bridge will only be a year late. I'm hoping it will only be $10 million over budget. Hi there. If that happens, that? what do we do about all of the other infrastructure projects that we desperately need to get done? Um, I'm happy to answer that question, but I feel like, are we going with everybody gets to answer the question? That's, that seems most fair to me. So the question is, if the bridge is over budget, how are we going to afford to pay for our other infrastructure projects? Uh, thankfully, we have done a good job over the last six years building up our infrastructure reserve funds. I don't think it's wise to tap into these unless absolutely necessary, but there is money there for these kinds of situations. What I think we need to do going forward, and this is really important, and this is one of the things that didn't happen. We did ask you, do you want to borrow $49.2 million for a bridge? But we didn't ask you, or should we seismically upgrade our community centers? Do we need a new crystal pool? Our fire hall needs to be repaired, how about that? What about the Bay Street Bridge? Going forward, we absolutely need to make large infrastructure spending decisions in context and with your input. So there, there will be money to pay for the bridge, but it has to come from other projects that are also important. Anyone else want to discuss this particular question? Thank you very much. Um, it's all one thing to say you want to go out and do consultation, 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 which is extremely important. But I do think you all need to be reminded that we got an independent engineer's report that said you need to fix this bridge or shut her down. That's the state. And so you have to come forward and say this is an important bridge for the economy of your downtown, for moving and transportation. And we went out and made those decisions and got the information and put it in front of you, where you actually got to vote in a referendum and tell us whether you support it or not. I do want to address briefly the time issue. Uh, Stephen's correct. Um, that because we had to go back and get the steel cast again to make sure it's the highest international quality, there's an estimate of a four to five month delay associated with that. I don't know whether we can make that up. I don't know if we want to. It's best to have a good quality bridge. So instead of having it in December of 2015, we're now looking for spring of 2016. But remember this, part of the decision was that we can keep the old bridge open and keep it going. And that's the important thing, to make sure our downtown and it stays alive. And that was an important part of this stuff. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And the, in, the question of infrastructure is an important one because it's been mentioned. There's a crystal pool that does need replacement. There's been about three reports done in the last seven, eight years and still no action on it. Why prepare reports if you're not going to act on it? You have a fire hall that will not withstand a major earthquake. You've got old sewer pipes and water lines that we do not want to see burst and cause tremendous inconvenience to you and your homes. So there is an importance of making sure your infrastructure is complete, but I can tell you this, I would not be moving ahead on any infrastructure project that does not have a proper budget and pro proper design going forward. And that is really what happened with the Blue Bridge project. The design was not complete, and no amount of funding from any level of government can change the fact that, Dean, you're accountable and, and cost overrun is a cost overrun. Absolutely, and you, ladies and gentlemen, you all know that we have a deficit infrastructure here in the city. Hands up who doesn't understand what that is. Okay, brilliant. Uh, what, we also have reserves. We've been putting money away in a bank account for the rainy day just in case something happens. I ask you to look to Christchurch. That's what those reserves are for. They're there in case we have a catastrophic event. If we dip into them now and start using that money to pay for a new uh, crystal pool, we spend it to do a no fire center, we're in trouble. So how do we deal with those capital projects? I think we deal with them through efficiencies. We need to find money within our city budget. Our administration is way higher than across uh, the region. You'll find that Sandwich, the largest municipality, has a lower per capita cost on that. We need to find those efficiencies in our budget so that we can move forward with those projects. But I'm not prepared to dip into our savings, the savings that are going to save us in case something, or as we've been hearing, something big happens. Thank you. Um, 
I was living up north in uh, Fort Nelson for a year and a half, and one of the things that the community there did to get some infrastructure built was they actually went to their local businesses and asked if they wanted to chip in. And they got a little bit of a splash logo on their theater, just what Spectre Energy pitched in money for. But there's no reason why we can't go to our good upstanding business groups and say, hey, would you like to help pitch in on these things? The other thing that we could do is maybe we have to get creative. There's, our, there's an awful lot of stuff that needs to get fixed, and we do have to prioritize, but maybe we can look at Maybe we have to close down the fire hall and, and, and partner better with the other fire departments around the city and, and make sure we've got clear access to the area that isn't being directly covered by it or, uh, in the case of an emergency. Um, or maybe we just have to park the fire trucks outside of the building until we can actually get this thing fixed. Same thing with the rec center. Maybe we have to look at finding ways to making it actually make money. And if we can't, then maybe we ought to be getting out of that business until we can afford to. Sorry. I was told in some of the, um, the the propaganda we got about the bridge that it was going to fall in the water by 2014. Now you're saying it's not going to be finished till 2016. But why is the whole cost of the bridge on the backs of the Victoria taxpayers? Sandwich, Oak Bay, uh, View Royal, they all come in and work in town go over the bridge. Why is there not, like they do in Vancouver, a toll put on until the bridge is paid? I'd gladly have a little um, transponder thing and every time I go over it clicks, this and that, but everybody that works for the provincial government, not all live in Victoria, we're getting the brunt of this whole bridge on our back. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it is honestly difficult being with the, we're, we're the core city. Um, we get 125,000 people that come down every day to work, to shop. Uh, later on in the evening, we have uh, close to 100, 150,000 people that will come into the entertainment district. We get both the benefit um, of having all the businesses and, and uh, their contribution, and we also get what's known as the core city uh, problem. I would like to see and how all you encourage you to look at that uh, amalgamation vote that is on the ledger. But you know, where you can get it is you can get it from the federal and provincial governments. So for example, on the Bay Street Bridge, one of our top priorities, uh, we can get all of the money from the federal gas tax money, just like they did at Craig Flower. That's your money, that's federal money. That's where everybody in the region and everyone in the country contribute to the Bay Street Bridge. As we move forward on the Crystal, we need to come out and have a conversation with you. But I think that we can get funding from the federal government, a third from the provincial government, and our own third. And we have an opportunity to bring these forward. We need to be able to understand it's a complex city. We have many projects we can undertake, and you have good fiscal prudent management at the city at all levels. Thank you. What about this bridge? You can ask the question. The simple answer is the federal government currently doesn't allow us to toll it, uh, but it would be interesting to see if we could basically do a toll that uh, because of license reader technology, we could uh, make sure the Victorians were free. I suspect the businesses downtown might push back saying it's going to discourage the business. So it's something that needs to be investigated and thought about uh, a little bit further. Any other uh, members of the panel on this very specific question? Okay, next question, please. Hi, I would like to talk about something other than the Blue Bridge. And my question is... Yeah. Yeah. My question is to hear specifically what your plan is for a connected, safe, uh, interconnected, safe cycling infrastructure in Victoria. They're all going to respond, yeah? Yes. I'm, I'm open to hearing from you all. I don't think the first guy should get a minute and then everybody else gets 30. You might want to allocate it evenly. How are you doing on that? Okay. Thank you. Thank God for the mayor. Okay. I'm not a big favor of bike lanes. Before you lynch me, let me explain. 
I believe that we should actually have bike roads. If we are going to make this one of the most accessible cities for uh, dealing with bikes, I would prefer to see models. They've done it in Vancouver. Yes, there was a bit of pushback from uh, motorists and business, but I would like to see a European model where we actually create major throughways through our city so that cyclists are not going to come in conflict with cars and that we can actually really promote ourselves as a safe cycling city. The issue, though, that I think that we need to talk about is we need to have it as a regional transportation plan, not just a Victoria plan. And unfortunately, we can do all the infrastructure we want within our own city, but then when you come to, say, Harriet and um, Gorge, it's all going to change. So I would like to see more bike roads for cyclists, and I would like to see us try to work with neighboring municipalities to expand that. Thank you. Um, uh, changes to clowns in favor of uh, exploring the possibility of, uh, of free buses in Victoria, fare free public transit, which exists uh, in a lot of places in Europe, uh, in a couple dozen cities and towns in the United States. It's, you know, it's not all that uncommon. Um, uh, and once, um, uh, uh, the, um, once that was in place, the, uh, the, a lot of the traffic problems, including uh, issues involving bike lanes and so on, would really look a lot different in the city. Um, you know, the, the, uh, there'd be such so much less traffic on the road that really the roadways would be a different place, uh, and the need for bike lanes would be quite different. Um, and so I think that uh, first step uh, when you're uh, talking about things like bike routes and bike lanes and so on is to implement fare-free public transit, and then go from there. See what the effect is on on traffic, and then uh, see what's needed after that. Thank you very much. So it's pretty clear that cycling is no longer just about recreation. It is, in fact, a choice for commuting. And in order for an area of the size of our capital region, it is important that we have good connections that you can get from one point that you would like to be located from to another destination you wish to get to. I think, uh, as I understand it, the CRD has a master plan for cycling and that there was a sufficient amount of community input. So that is where we really should start to see if that plan, uh, I think it was done a while ago, but approved, if it's still valid, to ensure that the connections are still relevant based on some other changes that have taken place, where people commute from, like the University of Victoria to downtown Victoria or to um, out into the Western communities, that those actually make sense. But most importantly, I'm a strong supporter of cycling routes that actually are safe. I'm not going to put in routes just for the sake of having cycling routes. Thank you. One minute's tough because we just finished the cycling task force to answer so many of your questions. We'll put that up. We went out and we talked to 2,800 people in the city of Victoria and said, what would get you on the bike? The committed commuter cyclists, uh, like myself, uh, like Lisa, we like lanes, but we'll ride no matter what. It's about how do we get the people who are thinking about it, how do we get the children on it, how do we get the, the parents with the kids on it. And they said, fundamentally, it was an issue of safety. And so that's what we're moving forward on. We're moving forward on uh, physically separated bike lines in the downtown core. That needs to be there. And we will use, although we're committing $5 million over the next four years to make that happen, we will use development money. So, for example, when the Jal property comes forward on, on uh, Douglas and Pandora, part of their responsibility of putting in will be a physically separated bike lane. That starts that running all the way up Cook. We are doing all ages and all ages and accessibility routes. One of the first ones which is really exciting is in Oaklands. And you'll see it move through the park and heading towards Hillside Mall. And finally, we will do all those connections of the routes out there. I want to leave you with this though. You can do one block of physically separated or two kilometers of lanes. So you just don't say one size fits all. You need to make sure it's in the right place. Thank you for the question. Uh, Stephen said you get to Harriet and the bike lane ends because you hit Saanich. Well, I bike every day to City Hall along Pandora Street and you hit, coming down Pandora, you hit Cook and the separated cycle track ends right in our own city. So what I will commit to, and it's, it's courageous and it's bold, but it's what our seniors want so they're not getting run over by kids and uh, parents on their bikes uh, on the sidewalk, it's what pedestrians want to feel safe, is 
uh, a north-south separated cycle track route and an east-west separated cycle track route. Yes, we need bike lanes, um, and it's true that that does help, but what we need to truly move forward, we've had you know, a long time to be on this. I don't understand why we haven't done more. So that's my commitment. We are updating the cycling master plan, and I'd like input about where those routes should go, but we cannot build lanes that come to a dead stop at Cook Street and expect people to get out of their cars. It actually has caused congestion, car congestion on Pandora because the cycle track just stops right there. So we've got to move forward in our own city. That's what I commit to. That's hard being last on this because there's so many good points and it's hard to not just be dubious, I guess I agree with what they said. Um, I think, so I'm going to add, throw in a slightly different topic, well not different, but slightly different change of subject. I, I think the buses that we have, the transit buses that have the bike racks in the front, there's only two spots for a bike and I frequently travel with a bus and I see people with bikes sit there and wait for a bus and they don't, you know, only see it pull up with two bikes already on it and they have to sit there and wait again. Which maybe in the middle of rush hour on a Monday afternoon isn't so bad, but on a Sunday like today when the buses run every half hour, you know, we, we ought to be having some sort of maybe dedicated or, or more specialized buses to carry bikes, more bikes on regular periods or maybe even having another bike rack on the back or something, but we got to find some way to get more people being able to take those long distances so they can go and enjoy their leisurely bike ride. Um, what are you going to do about sewage? Should we just be pumping it out into the straight of Wanda Pico? I, uh, I can't think of anybody to answer that specifically. Try to reverse off the board this time, yeah? uh, I believe that we should be doing as much as we can to treat our sewage. Um, but this is a complicated subject and I think the very first thing we should be doing is talking about what we currently have, what our options are, what the cost options are, and especially looking forward to what's the technology that's the cutting edge right now. Is there something that we can do? They're working in lots of ways to try and turn waste into energy. One thing I heard Vic Derman say at the CRD Board of Liquid Waste a bunch was talking about how we should be looking forward and making something here that actually makes you know, something more of a benefit than just treating our waste. We can actually go above and beyond. And I think that's the direction that we should be going, so. Thank you, good question. What are you going to do about sewage? When the McLaughlin Point plan was turned down, the mayors on the west shore, Esquimalt and west, got together and they said, that plan is dead, we need a plan B. They came together, they now have terms of reference that are about to be approved by the CRD to take action on the West Shore. They are light years ahead of us. In Victoria, Oak Bay, and Saanich, we didn't do very much at all for at least four months. Now, with the Mayor and Marianne also brought forward a motion in August to move forward on a Victoria-specific solution to sewage treatment, starting with public participation, which I support but we wasted time. The first thing that I'm going to do as mayor is sit down with the newly elected mayor of Oak Bay, the newly elected mayor of Saanich, and say, what are we going to do to create an east side solution? And you know what? We can even crib from the west side because they've showed leadership. Thank you. Um, I'm going to say if you want an opinion on what the West Shore is doing, you may want to ask uh, Councillor Jeff Young, um, but I'm going to skip that and say, what we've done in the city of Victoria, as we recognize, is that the majority of people in the city of Victoria want to treat their sewage. That they no longer believe that we can continue to put our untreated waste into the oceans and that's an okay thing. But what we're hearing back is, we want it done effectively, we want it done efficiently, we want to make sure that it's going to be reflect our values. We need to come out and have a quick, quick conversation with you. Just on those issues. What level of treatment do you want to have? And how much money you're willing to spend? because those things are related. And then the third conversation we need to have is what are your location criteria? At the CRD we said not in parks, not on agricultural land, not within 200 meters of housing. If we're looking at a site in the city of Victoria, or if we're looking on what we'll call a sub-regional site, 
Victoria Sandwich and Oak Bay working together, which is the other conversation. Do you want to do that together? Then we can start to move forward very, very quickly. My biggest concern was about losing the federal and provincial funding. We met with both ministers and they said, your money is there, but you need to move forward quickly. And that's what the city has done. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be coming out having that conversation with you because you're the ones that get to say how it gets done. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we all know that the debate about whether we treat our sewage is, uh, is really fundamentally over and that we are going to have to do this. And so the issue for me is, in fact, can we do it at the lowest possible cost with the best technology? And while it might seem attractive to go back to the drawing board, I don't think that's entirely feasible because we do have time limits based on federal and provincial dollars that are on the table. What I, be, I would be most fearful of is that we waste more time and possibly lose that funding. Now, while Dean says that he's met recently and that those monies are secure, I can tell you that if we are not going to provide an adequate plan that does in fact satisfy some of the concerns that the provincial and federal government want, we can in fact lose those dollars. And my concern would be then how much will that cost all of you? You already have the Blue Bridge boondoggle on, on top of that. You've got other infrastructure needs. The sewage costs are going to be horrendous. And we need to make sure those dollars absolutely are secure and move quickly. Thank you. It's been suggested that changes the clown that uh, by answering every question that comes along, uh, he ends up diluting um, the message about child poverty, about the crisis of child poverty in our community, I think there's something to that. And so I've been passing on, on some of the questions and that's something I do here. Uh, the day for training us who reaches 2020, we certainly have to do that. I am concerned when I start hearing that we're going to go out for consultation again and I can just see visions and a glossy paper coming in your mailbox picks option one, two, and three. You pick three and everyone's going to say, no, you've got it wrong, we're going to pick one. Uh, I think what we need to do, we, I can tell you that there are conversations already going on, by the way, between Oak Bay, Victoria, and Saanich. They have a plan. Unfortunately, that plan means going back to the current site at McLaughlin. And that means taking a scramble to court. I really don't believe that that's the way we should go. I believe we're in a situation where a squinal has democratically decided they do not want to do their land. I don't want to be paying lawyers. We need to find a solution that works between those three municipalities, Oak Bay, Saanich, and Victoria. We need to do it quickly so that we are not the subject of fines come 2020. Thank you. Sid, Sid, we need to make certain this aisle is clear, otherwise the fire marshal will shut us down. Is the aisle clear? Is it not? The yeah, the center aisle needs to be clear, unfortunately. Can we clear the center aisle, please? Make a room on the, on the sides for the gentlemen or anybody who's in the center aisle, please. Make a little bit of room so, you can, so those people can move out of the center aisle. Um, I had a question about land use. Um, we, as you know, some, some might know, we've been dealing with a big project on Mason Street, and I feel that um, the OCP is sort of a stack, stacked against the communities. The developers have all the concrete rules, and, and we are left with just, you know, uh, suggestions or so I was wondering whether you could strengthen the side of the community and bring in a green space ratio, for instance, or uh, uh, like they have the FSR and all this. But a green space ratio. Perhaps we start this one in the middle, since we've started both sides. Sorry, the message was Mr. Fortin. Thank you very much, and I'm actually quite encouraged that the proponents in what's known as is the Mason Street 
or, or the Vancouver Street or Bosa um, have made the choice to go back and talk to the community some more. Because fundamentally, we do want what's known as sustainable community development. Uh, development that is both sustainable from a green point of view, is it energy efficient, is it in the right place, how does it work with transportation, but also one that supports and builds up communities and neighborhoods. So we know that there is a need for some sort of development on that site, St. Andrew's site, um, but we need to make sure that it reflects the values of the community, protecting the farm behind it from shading, making sure that there is a mid-block cutway through that, making sure that it steps down from Pandora down to Mason Street. So I'm encouraged that the developer chose to go back as opposed to roll the dice and go to a full uh, meeting. It's important that we have those land use processes in place where communities have that first voice, and then they have an ongoing voice, and it helps shape the development moving forward to council. So uh, land use is important. Uh, green space ratio is about 40%, uh, usually generally in all development. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is a very, very important question, and it's one that every land use committee I think asks about what's going on in their own neighborhood. My feeling is that we need to fix the process. Now we do have a community association land use process and it works okay, but there's one fundamental problem. The developer meets with the community and then developer meets with City Hall. But the three parties, the developer, City Hall, and the community don't all meet until the public hearing which is at the very end of the process. So what I would like to see is for City Hall to play a facilitator role in those conversations early on between the developer, the city, and the planning department so all three parties involved can understand what the needs are, what the places for compromise are. I think that will make better developments and stronger community. So I really look forward to just tweaking the process and making it better for everyone. Thank you. Here, here. Uh, I'm going up north again with my answer because I've something that I've brought up a few, in a few of these meetings already. Um, I spent two weeks out on horseback in the Northern Rockies uh, last summer with this guy named Wayne Sawchuck. And Wayne created pretty much single-handedly this enormous area of the province called the Muspoka Chica Management Area. And it's a large protection area for, for animals and wildlife and it's also got provisions for uh, industrial development, protections for First Nation sites and accommodations for tourists. And how he got this was he got all the different parties together and said, okay, here's this big map of the area and let's go over and find out where there's no conflict and let's, let's figure out what we want to do with these pieces. And then the areas that you want to do something, you want to do something that conflicts, well then, we'll go off and work on your own thing and then come back to the table and we'll discuss and find some sort of uh, cooperation, some sort of, of compromise. And then finally, once they had this whole thing together, they brought it to the province and made it a law. And that's the process I think that the city should be doing. Let you decide what your neighborhood and your community should look like. Let the residents and the business owners and the people who live there get together on a planet. And then bring peace <laughs> I totally agree. I think we're in a situation where we need to move these projects fall, uh, forward a little quicker. What I would like to see in that area, because I walk it on, on a pretty regular basis along uh, Vancouver, past at St. Andrews, occasionally I pop into McDonald's. I don't like to admit that, but I do. Um, one of the things I would like to see is a visioning, uh, like a, a charrette program for that entire area, because it's not just St. Andrews. I mean, we need neighbors in, in that area because I think it's going to dissipate much of the activity that we're seeing in the 900 block of uh, Pandora. But I would like to see a greater input from the community, not only there, but across the region. So we deal with that whole area that goes west of Vancouver as well. And that would include going through the McDonald's, those empty stores, right down to the corner of uh, Quarter and Pandora. I think once we do that, that's one good thing. The second thing is I think we need to take more of a can-do attitude at City Hall. And that is that when you go in there, you are shepherded through the process in a quicker fashion, and we need to empower our staff more to allow that to happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I do believe that community associations play a vital part in helping shape our neighborhoods, and each community association are unique. They serve different purposes. So I am supportive of seeing the neighborhood plans that take shape with consultation 
so that whatever happens in that neighborhood, everyone is aware and is supportive. My understanding is that the OCP was developed about three years ago, so it was very broad for the entire uh, city. But since then, there have been, as I understand it, neighborhood plans for places like Cook Street Village, uh, for, um, I think, Fernwood, Guts Alley, Rothland. But what I understand, there hasn't been one, been one done here for Fairfield. And I think that that is a priority for this particular area, to respect that neighborhood plans uh, need to be developed, but each neighborhood is different, serving a different purpose, and therefore your input will help shape and guide what your neighborhood will look like. So I'm supportive of those. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ida, for giving me that question. It, it is one of the two questions that the community associations wanted asked. So I think now that you've addressed it, you should probably have the rest of the panel address those questions as well. Uh, I'll, I'll pose the first one quite along the lines of what you just responded to. Thank you. Uh, so let's start with uh, Mr. Ford and we'll go through the panel. These are the questions specifically requested by the community associations. And the first one is, what is your short and long-term vision of the role of community associations and centers within Victoria? Uh, Mr. Ford? Thank you very much. Uh, two things, community centers and also community associations. So community centers are our partners in recreation and they help us in local service delivery. And we need to continue to enhance both the services that they deliver and we need to move forward on the center's physical developments. Each center has a plan, we need to move forward on those. Such that the staff and the volunteers can deliver the best services that reflect the community needs. In regards to the community associations, I believe that they add their local neighborhood voices, both to the citywide issues and reflect those issues around neighborhood concerns. I believe we can build on the community centered network that uh, assist in proposal and funding. I also think for the community associations, which are critical to effective community consultation, that we can support. They are coming together and reorganizing what's known as the Community Association Network. That's a group of representatives from all community associations. We need to support that reformation. One of the great examples we did use was the development summit where we brought developers, city staff, and community associations together. It's a great opportunity and we'll do it every year. Thank you. Short-term vision for community centers and community associations is that we continue to invest in them. Um, we didn't raise the funding to community centers for the past five years. This year we did a little bit of extra investment. Long-term vision? I come from Fernwood uh, and I was involved in the Fernwood Community Center and the society when we bought the Cornerstone Building, opened a cafe, built affordable housing, bought another piece of land, built more affordable housing, and now they're on to other projects in Fernwood. My feeling is, and what I'd like to see as mayor, is that City Hall supports and nurtures innovative new ideas and new projects coming to us from neighborhoods. How do we do this? Edmonton has a fantastic model. Go home and Google Edmonton's Great Neighborhood Initiative. It was brought to my attention by Shelley Gudgeon. And on my website, I outline what a great neighborhood project will look like working with all our neighborhoods and staff in all of our departments to say what makes great neighborhoods, what are the deliverables, and what can we do together in the next four years. So I'm excited about that. Uh, after the election last year, uh, last term, three years ago, I started going to council meetings and bringing my cameras and recording the meetings because the city wasn't doing it. And because I felt that the first thing in the, in, the, in the 21st century, we should not be expecting people to have to come to a meeting in order to participate to see what was discussed. So I think that we should be doing the same thing for residents associations. I think a residents association should be streamed online. We should allow for com conversations to continue on Facebook and Twitter and whatever other internet media that's out there. We're increasingly a more online community and we should use those tools to help foster more community discussion about all of the issues. We should be talking about these issues regularly, both in person and online. As a reporter, I can tell you I learned more when I started talking to the people that live in the communities than I did and assuming that I knew what was going on. That's one of the key things. I've met with several 
members of the various uh, community associations as they've been knocking on doors, and the things I have learned about our city are amazing. You are the people that live in those communities, and I think that really what we should be doing is visiting you on a regular basis to find out what kind of uh, center you would like, how we can improve the services, how we can improve your community centers on an ongoing basis. That's why as, as mayor, I would move open door meetings to the various community centers and rotate them through to get your input. The short term vision is, I think we support the growth of community centers within the city of Victoria. And the long term vision is, I would like to see more of your voices, more renters and more homeowners, property owners at the table, assisting us with the vision for the city. Not only the, the micro vision, but the macro vision of what you would like to see in the future. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of concern these days about low voter turnout, and rightly so. You know, people are not engaged in our democracy. Um, uh, you know, the, the large numbers of people who boycott this, boycott the electoral system time after time, are communicating a message. You know, communicating a message about the system being broken. The system needs to be re revitalized. And things like neighborhood associations and community associations provide a possible avenue for that sort of thing. Um, you know, a community-based uh, uh, kind of uh, institution that uh, has has the potential to engage people in uh, in grassroots ways, right, in their in their neighborhoods and in their community. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of uh, hidden potential in uh, in things like neighborhood associations and, and community associations. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my question was that you would actually answer the second question about updating the neighborhood plans. And that was my impression. So you could still answer the first question about your short and long term vision of the role of community associations and centers if you wish. I think very simply the uh, community associations I've indicated do play a vital role for all the neighborhoods uh, around uh, Victoria. And based on what you want for your area, uh, your neighborhood plan should be a focal um, uh, starting point for that. So short term, I would advocate strongly to get your neighborhood plan for the Fairfield area because that has not happened. Uh, long term, of course, is where community centers provide uh, unique services and programs where you live close to where you live for healthy lifestyles. They too need to be supported, but they also need to be supported providing services that are relevant. Too many community centers oftentimes start off with programs, times have changed, different um, desires of, of, of age groups, we need to make sure that they continue to be relevant for what you want. Thank you. Okay, now we'll ask the second question from the Community Association. We're talking about a similar thing, but this is very specifically about the neighborhood plans. Uh, and, and various communities have had neighborhood plans already done, and some of them were done many years ago. Other communities have not. And I think nowadays, I think often we're calling these local area plans. So uh, we're going to uh, ask this second question from the community association, which is, now that the official community plan, that's the citywide official community plan, has been adopted, how will the city, under your leadership, support the process of updating neighborhood plans, particularly around the arterial and village centers? I really think this continuation of my answer before, I think that uh, we need to get the community together. I mean, I think uh, I was listening to CBC program actually recently, and they were talking about the idea of charrettes. And I think uh, for those, it basically is creating a kind of a model, getting people across the city, but also those that are using the area to come together and provide what their vision for the area is and, and, and that input. And that's what I would like to see. I think that. Um, you know, for us to impose our vision of what this com this community should look like in the long term is wrong. So I would like to, you know, come around and, and start saying, well, we need to sit down. What are the visions that you want to see? What are the amenities? What are the uh, what is the design structure of your community? And from that, we then move forward with the idea of how we're uh, going to design. So I, I I see the community really participating a lot in what that vision is going to be. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start off by saying um, this is very, very familiar because for every year for six years we've been here in other community centers uh, doing budget consultations, talking to you about where you want to see your budget go. We have a new police chief, and I can also remember a lot of you being here just mm, three or four months ago. 
where we came out and did a community consultation on policing and how policing happens in our community. We were going to move forward on that same sort of model. We used it through our harbor visioning process, and I think some of you helped build that vision for our inner harbor. And we need to do that as well with our local area plans. We will bring them forward. We'll also get together and do a charrette, as they call it, or whether they call it a local summit, on neighborhood transportation plans. But then it must make sure that those plans are followed with commitments in the infrastructure and funding to actually move forward on those. We can't just do plans. We need to actually have some action to follow them. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would encourage everybody running for office to read the official community plan and particularly to read the local area planning process. Um, I was very involved in, I guess, uh, it was changes that said community associations and neighborhood associations are a good way to get involved in, in democracy, and that's, that was my ladder into to city politics. We passed the official community plan in 2012, and as part of that, there was a very definitive local area planning process laid out. I believe it's in Chapter 6 in the Land Use Chapter. And in that chapter it says, we're not going to do comprehensive neighborhood plans anymore, because every neighborhood says, what about my plan? What we're going to do, and the question asks it brilliantly, is to plan where planning is needed. So as mayor for the next four years, when there are village centers where development is coming, when there are arterial corridors where development is coming, we'll engage the local area planning process as it's laid out in the official community plan. We'll come to you with our planning staff and we'll ask you, as others have said, what is it that you need? But it's, 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 there's a very specific, very important process laid out and I think that we should all be really aware of it because it does rely on your input to make those plans happen. First time that's happened. <laughs> uh, well, there's three sets of legislation that affect what happens in a local community. You have the local area plan, you have the official community plan, you have zoning bylaws. And these local area plans do exist. We do have these old versions, but they're not up to date. And I think the very first thing we have to do is go just parse through them and find out all the information that's out of date. Just update it. Get it so that's actually current, reflecting the current situation. Then we can start saying, okay, what's in the local area plan that doesn't match what's in the OCP and we're not, and especially in the zoning, what buildings are zoned that don't match with what either of the other two documents say? And let's just get that all out on the table in a nice big view that we can actually go through and say, oh, well, here's what the problems are. And then we can go to the community. And again, when I was talking about, go to you guys and say, this is your neighborhood. This is what all the documentation says is currently allowed. And here's where the conflicts are. What do you think? What do you, does, does the original co concepts in the, in the local area plan that were devised a decade or two decades ago in some cases, are they still reflective of what the mood of the community is? If they are, well then let's keep going with that and build it into the OCP. If the OCPs made changes to what the a local area plan is, well then maybe we need to update the OCP, but that's where we need to have that conversation. Uh, I guess this is a follow-up question to Mason Street because um, um, I'm quite dismayed by some of what I'm hearing at the front table. Um, I, I hear Steve and Andrew talking about expediting um, development permits while listening to communities. Um, and I hear Mayor Fortin saying that the developer at St. Andrew's site is, is uh, delaying the hearing that was announced for September 11th in order to um, consult more with the community. By the way, we haven't heard anything from them. I think they're waiting for the election to blow over to take heat off of you. And Lisa Helms, um, you uh, said in Douglas Magazine that half a dozen people on Maple Street were holding up. Could, could, we, could we have a question, please, sir? Yes, please. How are you going to start walking the walk? Because uh, from what I've seen, the um, council members listen to staff, they listen to big developers, when it comes to community input, they basically want to move things along step by step. So how are you going to change processes concretely to give more balance 
to community input because the OCP is being held up. And when you're confronted with a big developer, you're going for the density side of things and not the warm and fuzzies about uh, a walkable, livable community. Is it to a specific candidate to begin or the whole thing? Um, well, Mayor Fortin, Lisa Hell, okay. Stephen Andrews. So uh, start with us. Well, he, I think you need to address it to the mayor. So we start with Stephen. You guys work it out, Okay. Well, he did specifically address the very That's supposed to be something we're using. If someone asks a question or something specific, then that person starts. Okay. Thank you. During the 1970s, they had a pro development mayor and council that came in. And they jammed in View Towers, they jammed in Orchard House. You saw all those huge towers come and they cut the community out. And the net effect is it got really inappropriate development. And we had a community that came up and rose up and stopped all development in the community. We worked really hard to make sure that we have sustainable development that is supported by communities. So I know some people say move it forward faster. That just takes it out of the hands of councils who you elect and also out of you, the community, to make sure that you're, so we need to make sure your voice is there. We'll hear some people saying we want to, you know, basically devolve it, let uh, staff make the decision. Your voice needs to be heard, and that's extremely important. We need to make, thank you. So, fundamentally, that land use uh, procedure is important. You can't put council working with developers with the community, because council has a legal role to hear a public hearing that they have an open mind. And if they're bringing forward a development that they've already signed, sealed, and delivered, then the public hearing is a farce. So you need to make sure that the developers and the community works together, but then the council has the final decision at the public hearing when they hear from you. Thank you. Uh, so how are we going to walk the walk? So first of all, I want to clarify, I think the mayor might have misinterpreted my suggestion. It wasn't that council goes out and works with the developer and the community. It's that we empower our very great uh, staff, they have a lot of work in community development, to act as more a facilitator role rather than the city, the developer, and the neighborhood working in silos. So that's number one. Ch just tweak that process a little bit. Number two, in terms of my comments in Douglas Magazine that said something to the effect of if this doesn't go forward, it sends a very strong signal to the development community. At that time, when I did the interview in April, we didn't have a petition from the neighborhood with 450 signatures saying yes in our backyard but not this development. When I saw that input from the neighborhood, you bet my mind changed. You bet I said we've got to do a better job. So that's the kind of leader that I am. I'll make some really strong comments about my opinion. When I get new information, particularly from 450 residents, I listen. So thanks for the question. I'm beginning to feel I should be wearing a red nose and a funny hat too. Uh, just a little bit about, just to clarify my point. Yes, I want to expedite development so that when those projects come to City Hall that we can give them some certainty. But as I mentioned before, I believe that the community needs to have input. There's no sense in us putting a 32-story tower, for instance, at the corner of Vancouver and Pandora if the community doesn't want it. doesn't make sense, and that's not what I'm saying. But once we get to that point where it's working, where the community supports the vision of the project moving forward, then we need to move so the developer has some certainty because, I mean, they, they need to, to move quickly through that process. I believe that staff can assist uh, the developer when they come in and also by the way I don't think that council needs to prejudge it but certainly council needs to go and listen to what's going on and be in a contact with the community because if they are then I think they'll know what the vision is for that area sure um, I think what's really important is that uh, you do have to respect your official community plan, which is where your input as a community uh, comes in. And once that's determined, then to work in collaboration with the other neighborhood and local area plans 
so that everybody is aware of what is expected in that neighborhood because you are being asked to provide that input. Once that is all in place, then any development that takes place, any developer who comes in is keenly aware of what your desires are and this back and forth is not healthy for the community, it's not healthy for those who want to bring investment into the city as well as jobs into the city. So it is important that uh, that process is clear, it's consistent, uh, and so that uh, you can move forward uh, in areas that do require redevelopment and also respects the neighborhood. It's about certainty, but it's also about respect for your neighborhood. Uh, I want to go back to the public hearing for the official community plan that was adopted a few years ago. Um, when council went and finally heard everybody's point of view and decided, okay, now we're going to actually discuss this for ourselves and decide what this is what we want to adopt or not. Basically, the mayor said, okay, we're going to go councilor by councilor, and I want you to mention everything that you can think of in this OCP, and they flip back and forth, page and page and page. You couldn't follow the conversation. What they should have done was they should have gone page by page and go over detail by detail. This is what this plan says. Does anybody have any comments? And let's go over how this impacts the local neighborhood plan, the zoning bylaws for that area. And you wouldn't have issues like the St. Andrews problem. You would have a full understanding of what every decision makes. Instead of you just get a whole big map and everybody just says whatever they feel and you get basically a random decision. And that, to me, is not democratic process. So where do you stand on whether you think in-camera meetings are a good idea or not, and whether you would minimize them? Uh, we'll start with the obvious answer that there are times that in-camera meetings are legally required. That if you uh, if it, it, it impacts legally the state of the city, then you have to go in camera as well as for dealing with you know, uh, individuals who are employed with the city and so on and so forth. However, I believe that if a council goes into camera, they should be saying exactly what the topic of the subject is, why they're going into camera, and explaining as much as they can without divulging the in-camera discussion, both before they meet and after they meet, to help for transparency. We should know what is it you're going behind closed doors to talk about. And that is not done in the city, right? Thank you. I believe that sharing as much information with the public as soon as possible is the best thing to do because we're making decisions on your behalf with your resources. Um, as Jason said, there are three times when we're required to go into camera if it's personnel related, if it's legal advice, or if it's intergovernmental relations. One of the things that we've implemented since our new city manager started in February is a regularized reporting out process where once a quarter we review the in-camera decisions we've made and we say, okay, can these be revealed? If yes, then we make them public. So I think that kind of process is really important. One of my frustrations is when individual councillors put up their hand at a meeting and say, I have an in-camera inquiry or I have an in-camera sharing. That's not good enough. If I were the chair of the board, aka the mayor, I'd say written report about your reason for going in camera and give us the section of the council bylaw and give us the topic. So we go in willy-nilly sometimes at the request of one councillor and that's not okay. Thank you. Open government has been extremely important to the city of Victoria, extremely important to me. There's three major things that we did do. We brought in webcasting so that you can actually watch and see what's going on and you can see how your council are voting and how they say and the reasoning behind it. We actually put in two extra FOI staff so that we could get freedom of, of information requests and we could get them out as fast as possible. That was really important that we had the ability to respond quickly. We also brought in the Ombudsman, Kim Carter. And she did a review and took a look at her practice and she brought forward what's known as an open government checklist. 
And we're meeting every single one of those checklists. The one recommendation, which as Council uh, uh, Helps has said, was that we review every item that has been in camera and to see if that, the reason why it was in camera still exists. And if it doesn't, then we post it. And we do that. Once a quarter, we post everything to our city website so you can go in and see what decisions are there. As regards to uh, individual councillors, we do ask for the stated reason. We do request that they meet with the legislative officer to review if it's a valid in-camera reason. And then it is, of course, the will of the council table, which includes councillor helps, to either object and ask it to stop or to see if the majority of council wants to go in because they feel it's a agenda reason. Uh, thank you. So as I understand it, you're quite correct. There are an excessive amount of in-camera meetings that this council has had over the course of this uh, current term. Three issues, or why you go in-camera, it's already been mentioned, but I, I think it's uh, different from what uh, Lisa has said. It's land, legal, and labor, or personnel, as they say. It's legislated in the community charter as to when you go in-camera, and those are the only reasons why you need to. And I have stated in my platform at idachongvictoria.ca that I will definitely adhere to those strict guidelines as when it's necessary to go in camera. Uh, you deserve to know what your council is debating and it needs to be transparent. So reduce the number of in camera meetings only to the extent that they are required by the law. I have been pledging all along through my campaign that I'm going to run an open and transparent government. Yes, personnel, legal issues, and land issues. If we are having that many in-camera meetings, something's wrong. Either we've got major personnel issues that we need to deal with, or we've got major legal issues. So something, I think, is not exactly right there. I believe that we should not be having as many in-camera meetings, and I think rather than rising and reporting once a quarter, that we should be able to come out and rise and report on generalities that don't uh, disclose the confidence of in-camera meetings. And I too think that they should be justified so that when we are moving in camera, there's a justifiable reason and that you, we can maybe give the item a number or whatever it is, you can then track it and you would be aware of how many, one, in-camera meetings we held, and two, when you can expect an answer from that. Thank you. Just have a show of hands of anybody who still would like to ask a question of the candidates, yeah, please. Two, three, four, okay, we do have four. another segment potentially, but I don't want to cut off questions from the floor. So let's proceed with the next gentleman, please. I think you've got six more. I would like to know what you think the city of Victoria should do about to do to prepare for the coming changes, the impact of uh, of uh, climate change. Well, I think that uh, one of the things that we need to do is obviously move away from uh, older forms of transportation. I was talking about this uh, at the old buses that are in town, but we should encourage uh, companies to use uh, newer forms of technology so that uh, we're seen as a leader in that area. I also think that uh, obviously by improving uh, cycling through the city that we can reduce um, uh, carbon fuels uh, being emitted into the atmosphere. And the other thing I think that we should be doing is really just like Langford has established with their interface program where they require certain materials to be used in their buildings, that that is something maybe the city of Victoria can look towards to I, I mandate and encourage people to use um, less invasive uh, tools and uh, less invasive uh, building um, materials as, as we're moving forward with the development. Uh, thanks very much. And so I would agree in part with Stephen with, with regards to finding ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and that in part starts with uh, finding alternative fuels, uh, looking at electric vehicles, things like that. Uh, so when it's time to renew your fleet and you know all the vehicles that the city of Victoria has It really is time to take a look at those uh, lower emitting vehicles and also electric vehicles if at all possible uh, Some of course uh, are, are larger vehicles that may not be possible. I also am very supportive of the um, the uh, idling bylaw that requires vehicles to uh, city vehicles to not uh, stand by idling because that also is about uh, emitting greenhouse gas uh, emissions 
Uh, in addition, it, we do talk about making sure that we give uh, residents an opportunity to find alternative ways of commuting. If that means more cycling, more walking, more transit, all those are going to contribute towards uh, making us a more healthy and a more uh, a vibrant city. So those are areas that we're looking to. Thank you. Um, as you sort of indicated, there's two sides to climate change. One is, what are we doing to reducing our greenhouse gases, which basically lessens um, the impact of climate change. Secondly, mitigation. We know it's going to happen. What are we going to do about it? So quickly, we are continuing to do just that, getting rid of the use of fossil fuels, whether these are busing, transit, electric charging stations. We also need to recognize that climate change brings two major things. Well, what it does is it brings bigger weather events. Uh, for us in Victoria, the biggest concerns obviously are drought, uh, but even major concern is storms. Uh, the impact that's going to happen on the Dallas Road Bluffs, all of those sort of things are major things. Also, our infrastructure, that you get way more water in way more short of a period of time. How are you going to make sure that that water gets off the road and doesn't flood? Those are where we are putting our efforts in. It also includes what type of tree species we're going to start planting. But fundamentally, the first thing we need to concentrate on and always remember that if you build strong neighborhood and communities, that if you make, for example, Cook Street Village walkable, usable, all your resources are there, and you don't have to have those larger transportation needs, then you can support each other. Thank you. That's a really important question. Cities are probably the best level of government positioned to deal with uh, climate change. And I just jotted down a short list of some things here. So green all of the city's operations, and we're making some headway in that regard. Uh, encourage and support our residents in greening their homes and their small businesses. And there's some great small businesses in the business of helping other businesses become uh, more green. Um, build cycling and pedestrian infrastructure that's been covered. Um, density downtown, it's really important. There are a lot of young people who drive in from Langford every day. If they could live in a building downtown and walk to work, we cut greenhouse gas emissions a lot. Uh, support our residents in greening their homes, I've said that. Uh, green roofs, no net loss of green space as the city develops. There are again cities around the world who are planting parks on rooftops. We don't need to lose, lose green space in exchange for density and also make Victoria's economy a leader in green and clean tech. Thank you. I think one of the great things about the city is just how environmentally conscious we are as a whole. Um, and I think that that's something that we don't take advantage of nearly as much as we could, especially as far as business is concerned. And I think one of the things that the city could do was to use the Victoria Conference Centre to actually host regular, maybe annual or even twice annual, conferences to talk about green energy, green, uh, to deal with you know energy production, to deal with uh, waste management, to deal with pollution, and all the actually get people and encourage businesses to start here and actually become a world leader in environmentally conscious technology and business. And I think that if we worked and talked about it regularly and brought experts in and actually formed some sort of a regular conversation that went on, we could actually see a lot more money coming into the city and we could actually have the, the impact that I think we all want. anywhere 
Or can there still be spots, at least, that can be respected? And give one, one example. In 1865. Can we get the answer? <laughs> yeah, I think we've got the question. Thank you. That's a great question, and you are a great advocate and a person who works very hard on behalf of Heritage. I've learned a lot in my term on council, in particular from Councillor Madoff, and she talks often, and I hear often from her and others, that while other cities like Vancouver have kind of destroyed a lot of their heritage buildings, we haven't. And I support that. We have a great heritage tax exemption program to get old heritage buildings into use, to get residential upstairs. With regard to this, those warehouses in particular, I'm looking forward to seeing the development proposal come forward. I'm, I'm willing to, so I, the question was, do we need height everywhere? Absolutely not. The OCP lays out very specific guidelines for Old Town and for the Harbour, and I think that those are accurate, those are right. One thing that I'm willing to entertain, though, is it's very expensive to restore old buildings, and what are the kinds of win-wins that we can get to have those old buildings preserved and the density that's needed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa's correct. It's very prescribed under the official community plans, and it's why we're doing the local area plans where we're just concentrating on the villages. We recognize that the residential areas, we don't need to go back and look to see if we need to make changes there. We want to make sure that your residential communities and neighborhoods are stable. They stay what's known as R1 residential. That's what we want to do. We focus on the local area plans. Heritage preservation is really important. We've been able to see some success over the last six years. We've seen the junk come back. We see the Janion coming forward. We've seen the mountain equipment co-op, allowing for one and two additions slightly on top there, uh, of moving those projects back into new life. I think the one next step that I'd really like to move forward, and we actually need provincial permission for this, but even though, and this goes back a little bit to the green stuff, even though we have a, not, a new green building, we have a hundred buildings that are leaking heat and energy. So what we can do, much like the Heritage Tax Grant, is we can allow people to go in, do all of those energy efficiency upgrades, which keep those old buildings working, save money, and reduce greenhouse gas, and we can do that uh, with provincial permission. <laughs> I have a friend who says that Victoria is not just a heritage city and that we have to leave everything the way it is. It's a 21st century city with a heritage foundation. I totally believe in that. Um, one of the issues that I think we need to do, we need to provide greater incentives for some of the heritage buildings to, uh, to be remediated. It's why uh, I propose that we look at extending the tax incentive program in some of what I would call the uh, We've got rid of the low-hanging fruit in the downtown area. Basically, there's some others that need to be dealt with. So what I would suggest we do is look at extending the tax incentive program to maybe 15 years. And we would do it on a case-by-case -case basis, and there would have to be some qualifications on how we would move forward. We would obviously talk about staff to encourage developers to start working on that. I don't believe height is the solution for density. I think we can do some infill in those areas, and, but we need to take a balanced approach and not just lean totally one way and say heritage buildings must remain heritage buildings. But I also don't agree that we should knock them down, just so you know. Thank you. So the question was, is the idea to build density anywhere? And I guess the short answer is no. Uh, density uh, should take place where it is appropriate and where it has been accepted. There's another benefit of focusing density in specific areas, which is you have large populations in the centers, and that means you can focus your transit system on those areas and ensure that they get good connections between those areas and serves more of a population. So I absolutely think we should be densifying, but densifying in specific areas and leaving most of the older neighborhoods where it's single house dwellings or, or you know, less dense areas alone. Uh, you know, and if you know the city gets big enough that we run out of space in the urban areas, then that's a question that will have to come up again. But for the, for the short term, for the foreseeable future, focus in the, in the urban areas like downtown and leave the other areas with a lot of the heritage uh, alone. Council 
Good. I'd like to hear what the council plans to do to bring businesses back to Victoria. I get concerned when every second window seems to have a for rent sign. Well, having a lot of available stock actually can be a good thing for new business. Not not for the established stuff, the Walmarts and the, you know, the stables and whatnot. But for people who want to create a new business, having old building that's empty and, and in, not in demand means that the rents are low. That means that the, uh, the, the amount of money that you need to be able to survive the starting year or two to actually get your business established and actually have a, a viable business is, is prolonged. That's a good thing. What we should be doing is encouraging people here to start up new businesses, to come up with ideas for things that are currently being imported elsewhere and replace them being built here. Make it, make, build local and support local business. That money recycles in our economy and actually increases. If we buy something at Walmart, the money goes away. We should be encouraging local business to grow and that's something that the city can help. Thank you. For me, this is a number one priority. If you go to my website, which is lisahelpsvictoria.ca, go to the page called City of Opportunities, and you'll see a very clear, detailed, focused plan with timelines and deliverables, so you can hold me accountable, to revitalize our downtown, to fill those vacancies. So what I will do with my council is create an economic development office. We've got one person doing economic development at City Hall. She's got a very wide mandate. Create an economic development at city office at City Hall. Staff it with enterprise facilitators who understand city's processes and small business and task those people with helping businesses get started and with filling those vacancies. And you can measure it. Year one, the vacancy rate is here, 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 here. Mark the changes and we really need to measure this. Don't have time, it's a number one priority and please do have a look at City of Opportunities to find out more, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are in the position of the City of Victoria and I'd actually put it a, a little bit first step further uh, than just having the Economic Development staff. What we need is an Economic Development Commission that is arm's length from City Council so they can act nimbly take a business first approach and move forward to bring those businesses in. We are working with the Downtown Victoria Business Association to develop and put into place a, a retail retainment and attraction plan and that is coming forward. And finally, we're investing in our downtown. We have brought in through the federal government, Western Diversification, $250,000 a year to work with what's known as the Greater Victoria Development Agency, where we have sort of a three-point plan, which is to open new markets for local businesses, to have all our universities working together in something that's now known as Education Destination Victoria and look for airport expansion along with the Belleville Terminal as making sure that those gateways for tourism remain open to us. So those are the plans, they're moving forward and they're working. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I have been very concerned about the vacancy rates uh, in uh, Victoria, especially downtown Victoria. They've been increasing the 40 signs uh, are uh, everywhere. It's, it's not a happy situation in downtown Victoria. That's one of the reasons why I have said that it's important to have a four-year tax, property tax rate freeze, because that also affects uh, business owners because they pay the property taxes through their rent. And if the rents are high because they keep having increases in property taxes, that is a deterrent as well. I've also noticed that there's about 212,000 square feet of vacant office space in downtown Victoria. 93,000 of which is in heritage buildings. So I've also proposed that what we can provide is what we call a heritage tax exemption to get that 93,000 space provided to motivate entrepreneurs to move to Victoria. This is not to move from one building to another. Businesses to Victoria specifically to those 93,000 square feet. Each 100 square feet of space can create one job. That's 900 new jobs in downtown Victoria to support all the other small businesses. Plank number two in the changes for me or election platform is a living wage policy. 
Um, by putting uh, more, more money in the pockets of low paid workers, the living wage policy, a shift to a living wage standard in a community has a major revitalizing effect in the, in the local economy. Um, it, uh, when when, uh, when a, a low paid worker gets more money, uh, that money tends to be spent in, 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 uh, in the local community on important needs. It doesn't get extracted from the local community, it doesn't get taken out of circulation from the economy, uh, for example, by uh, being invested in the stock market or being uh, ferreted away into a retirement fund or being spent on a, 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 a winter vacation in the tropics. Instead, uh, the money, the, uh, the money <coughs> that's going into the pockets of the low paid worker gets spent basically immediately in the local economy on important needs. And so this has a revitalizing effect. Thanks. Um, I believe your question is what can we do? And the qu this is a question that uh, really we need to speak to the business owners. And what I have, I was just downtown uh, Thursday morning and she's shooting a video which is on my website, stephenandrew.ca. And the number one issue is that the property owner came up to me and a business owner because they've just closed a business in downtown Victoria is taxes. Businesses pay in this city 3.18 times higher than what the uh, residential tax rate is. And they say, if you can drop that, that's gonna, gonna help. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna set councillors to focus on the issues. One is to create a councillor that is in charge of economic development. And that means in a committee stage, developing policy along with business owners, property owners, uh, to come up with some policy that we can actually affect change. The next thing I would like to do is have a rental fair downtown, and that would put property owners in direct contact with prospective renters where we can create creative leasing opportunities, maybe not long-term, but short-term, to fill those empty spaces. <laughs> okay. Re regarding the uh, liquid uh, waste issue, Stephen and Andrew say there's a plan to take uh, for Oak Bay and uh, Sandwich and Victoria to take uh, Swan off the court. Now, is there a backup plan? Uh, should should uh, you lose uh, for the effluent forming, uh, leaving a Clover uh, Point? Uh, how, do we gonna, how are we going to meet our legal responsibilities if uh, yeah. So sorry, sir. Did you say that it was my plan to take this final no, no, court? No, I okay. It well, I think it came out. I think it it did. So that is that is the plan yeah, that they, they sure. have in the back pocket. I believe that is completely off the table. I think we should sit down and create a semi-regional plan that I believe can be achieved between Oak Bay, um, Victoria, and Saanich. We're going to have to look for the appropriate zoning space for that. And you are correct, sir. We need Plan B. Currently, the COD went through with one plan, one plan only, and they had no plan B. They blinked, they tried to force this into a Squamalt uh, municipality. It didn't work. The province had always told them that it wasn't going to work, yet they went merrily forward down that train track. So, so I guess, uh, okay, just address to Ida, Dean, and Melissa. Uh, what is the plan for, for Clover Point if it isn't going to be a call? In other words, you mean, will the major sewage treatment plant be located at Clover Point? Is that your question, sir? Well, no. But are we going to meet our legal responsibilities if it isn't going to be going out of Macaulay Point? So let me start off and say, uh, for the city of Victoria, there is no plan to try and legally force a supply mold into taking us. Um, I don't think it will work. Uh, there's no way it's going to be done in any way um, of timing to, to meet the federal and provincial deadline. Uh, no, that's off the table. Um, Victoria needs to move forward uh, and take a look to see if we want to do it individually or you want to do it as a sub-regional plan with those people that, that are there. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. I think that I don't want to make the same mistake where you come in and say, well, I'm just going to put it here. Um, I think we need to go out, we need to talk to make sure that our residents support the plan that we put into place as indicated by Ida, that we do need to move fast. We need to make sure that that money, that 44% of that $500,000, sorry, that $500 million, uh, which is federal and provincial money, 44% of that's the city of Victoria's. That's part of our flow. 
100% of, of base flow comes to us, 30% of Saanich comes to us. Saanich has got some big problems, we'll let Frank deal with those, but we need to move forward and we need to move fast. Thank you. I think uh, I did in my other um, remarks to the question, uh, basically said that we do need to collaborate with the other partners and have a good dialogue and discussion as to what we're going to do and present a viable option or plan so that we do not lose the funding. At the end of the day, we are going to be required to treat our sewage. The question is, can we do that at the least uh, cost to all of the taxpayers and can we do one that actually is uh, using the best technology possible? I think that was a problem with what was happening. People did not believe the plan that was presented actually had even the best technology. That's where we started with some of that failure. Thank you. I believe I kind of answered this question earlier. Um, my position is that the day after the election, or the day after I'm sworn in, I guess, uh, I would um, sit down with the mayor of Oak Bay, whether it's Frank or Richard Atwell, uh, the mayor of uh, or sorry, the mayor of Saanich, whether it's Frank or Richard Atwell, the new mayor of Oak Bay, and the three of us say, we've got to do this, there's no question about it. We do need a cost-effective solution. We also need to look at proven technologies around the world. Malmo, Sweden, runs its city buses on its waste. We've got to look bigger picture at a closed loop, longer term solution. I'm not suggesting that that is the idea for here, that we run our city buses on our waste, but we've got to get into the 21st century with this. Otherwise, we are going to have people saying, not in my backyard. But what if a sewage treatment plant, a resource recovery plant, is buried beneath the park, you don't even know it's there. We've got to start thinking bigger about our waste. I attended the Esquimalt uh, public hearing meeting where they actually voted down the proposal by the CRD to actually accept the McLaughlin Point uh, plant. And the big real reason why they didn't like it was the fact that, well, one, it was all this coastline, but it was so huge. And it was out past the tsunami line that they were worried that this thing was going to, when they had the tsunami, they were going to actually flood the whole region with sewage. And, but the big issue why it was so big was because we weren't fixing our pipes. One of the reasons why this plant had to be so large is because the amount of sewage increases by a hundred fold, a hundred times, or a hundred percent, sorry, um, on a really heavy rain day or more. It's because our pipes allow water that comes from clean rainwater, gets into our sewage and mixes in. The, if you want the best bang for your buck and you're dealing with waste, you do it at the source. You prevent the issue from getting, you prevent whatever it is you're trying to treat from getting in the system in the first place. So fix our leaky pipes and also work with our, our, our homeowners to say, separate your grey water from your black water. Use your grey water that comes from your, your sink and use it to maybe water your lawns and you can, you can treat it on site and you can reduce the amount of waste. It means we can reduce the size of the plant and either McLaughlin or some other places. Thank you. <laughs> Mine is a simple question. How many startups survive five years in business here in the city of Victoria? Yeah, startup businesses. We're talking about starting a business, right? How many survive five years? Does anybody know the answer to that? I heard 15%. 15% of all startups uh, survive. Um, but I do encourage you to go take a look. Uh, we were able to move Viatech into the downtown core. They've been very uh, successful as an accelerator. There's also a guy named, um, oh gosh, I just blanked him, but he's just across the road on, on View Towers, uh, sorry, on, on View Street, where they're also doing these, these incubators. It's about, but I do know this, all of the net new jobs in the last 15 years have happened through small and medium businesses, have happened through entrepreneurial, and that's where the new jobs are, and that's what we're trying to attract into our downtown. That's what's going to fill the office spaces in the downtown court. Now, what I, was, what I was told about five or six years ago, and it was on Government Street, one of the... I'm sorry, sir, we don't have discussion. Uh, oh, let yeah. the other... Uh, we can chat after, I'll be good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
Sure, thank you. Um, I, I want to chat afterwards too because I want to know what the data is. Um, I don't know the answer to the question how many startups survive five years, but I do know a thing or two about what it takes to start a business. Yes, I'm sure you do. So I ran, uh, started an organization five years ago called Community Microlending, and that organization makes loans to people who don't even qualify for credit at a bank want to start a small business. Maybe they've just come off the streets, maybe they've come out of prison, maybe they've come from a women's transition house. What people who start businesses need is support and mentorship. Now that's not necessarily the role of City Hall, but small businesses succeed when they are supported, when they have mentorship, and when there's a strong local economy that can support their businesses. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I sure as heck know a lot about startups. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, new to the micro lending concept of just reading uh, Mohammed Yunus's book, if I got the name right, um, about it. And it's really fascinating. It, uh, if you ever do check, get a chance to read it, it's, it's a really neat read. Um, and, and concepts like that, of, of encouraging people who no, can't get access to capital to create new businesses. Banks generally are really hesitant to loan to another, a new idea. They'll lend for the 15th uh, restaurant or the 15th shopping center. Uh, but they won't let for a new idea very easily, so it's much harder to get that capital to start. Um, one of the things the city could do is actually create perhaps a, um, a business uh, area where you could actually even have some sort of a subsidized rent to allow people to start off a fledgling business that maybe isn't going to make money right off the bat, but actually could work if they're given a little enough time and, and work with the city. Sorry. So the question was how many startups survive five years? Um, interesting question because that's one of the reasons why I said I'd like to do the heritage tax exemption uh, for five years. For those 93,000 square feet of uh, space in heritage buildings and that will provide or possibly create up to 900 new jobs. Those people in those jobs will spend money downtown will be able to support other businesses to ensure that we do have a more thriving downtown and not have all those vacant spaces. Uh, I'm an accountant by profession and I used to do books for people and we used to say if you can manage the first three years without losing your shirt you can probably get to year five. And if you were lucky back then it was about one in five businesses could make it to the third year and then get on. In Victoria the costs are prohibitive the property tax rates do get passed down to them, they're, they're, and that's one of the reasons why uh, people aren't coming downtown. I can say in the Western communities, I think they're much more successful. Thank you. Definitely it is not the job of the City of Victoria to uh, help startups uh, operate their business. But I do believe that it's the job of the city to create an environment where, one, we have a competitive tax structure, where we have affordable housing. We create that environment where the city lays out a plan that is going to have some future for the young people here rather than leave the island and have to go to Vancouver or other cities. And we have a safe and lively downtown core. If we don't have those, situations, startup or not. I mean, I've spoken to a business owner that's been downtown for 35 years, and even they are struggling right now because of the taxes. We need to get our economy in line. And once we do that, I think we, we, we then provide them the best chance they can have for that startup to succeed. Thank you. I think we've, uh, we're just about at the end of our process. Uh, our candidates have been here three hours and more. We did say we we're going to have the last segment. I think just about everything can be asked has been asked. However, this last segment is the possibility of a candidate asking another candidate a question. If it's a question that hasn't already been asked, don't ask something that's already been asked. We can start with Jason. Do you have a question for another candidate? I have a question for Dean and Lisa. I no, like, one candidate, please. Okay. Just one at a time. Okay, well then, Justine, why did the City of Victoria approve a completely new budgeting process um, 
without seeing any examples of what that budgeting process has looked like and when their quarterly update or the update that just happened that said this is where we're currently at. Again, there were no performance metrics that they said they were made, the staff had them, but they weren't presented in the report. So why, why is council allowing a new budgeting process with a new council coming in at the same time that they haven't actually seen what this thing's going to look like? I think what Jason's referring to is um, city council uh, are moving forward to a process where we start to link um, budgets to, to metrics. So how many building permits do you have? Do you get out of a variety of things like that? So we can measure uh, ultimately that you're getting the services that you're putting forward. Staff are currently working towards with that. It's about working forward with the new city council, whoever, and even if everybody comes back, you're still a new council. Um, that when you come back in January, that those things are coming forward so you have an opportunity to say, are things being delivered on time? Are we measuring the right things? Are we getting the services that we paid for? So uh, we're moving forward on it, Jason. Um, it's a new process. And it's one of those things where better is always possible. And we just keep continue to do continuous improvement. Thank you. This helps, eh? uh, I'll actually, I'll pass, but will we all have time to make closing statements? No, nope. we're just about out of time. Now. Okay, well, my closing statement is thank you all very much. And I have no questions. You've done such a good job that I have no questions left to ask my folks, uh, fellow colleagues up here. So thank you. Dean, any questions? No, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass. Okay. Talk to other people. Ms. Chow, any questions? One question. Well, I actually do have a question, and I have the question of, for Dean. So, Dean, uh, Victorians have heard you say emphatically over the past uh, several weeks that the Johnson Street project is a fixed price contract at $92.8 million. And in fact, I believe you're seeking re-election re based on that fact. So my question is that, if elected, will you resign if the $92.8 million fixed price is not met? That's a good question, Ida. <laughs> I believe that we have a fixed price contract. I believe that we can hold the line on that, and I'm very confident on that. Um, I do want to say that uh, it is always a difficult situation where someone who is trying to be mayor has already admitted that they're going to pay more costs to the people, and now it's just an issue about whether how much it is. I will protect your, your money. I will protect my money because I live in the city of Victoria, and I will make sure that we get value for money. I'm holding the line on the budget. A contract is a contract and that's my expectation and that's my demand from my staff, from everybody that's out there. Thank you. Uh, changes? Do you have a question? I wasn't going to have a question but now I have to. <laughs> Dean, for once in your life can you answer a question with a straight answer? You, you were asked and it is a simple, I'm going to make it simple because it'll, it'll probably help you answer. Yes or no? If the bridge doesn't come in at $92.8 million, will you resign? Yes or no? In the end, my expectation is a contract is a contract. Let me say this, let me say this because I know what you guys are saying. But let me say this, council can vote to pay them more money. You are a one vote on council, but you know that I am fighting all the way and I'm prepared to make sure that you get the best legal and we will protect that all the way. I'm not giving your money away. I know they want to do it. I know they're trying to present it as spinning it out of control. But fundamentally, I'm the person up here that's saying a contract's a contract and I'm fighting to hold it at that 92.8. Yes or no? So there we go. I will do everything we can. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It was a quite an quite interesting evening. Excellent question. Particularly thank the candidates for all their patience. Thank you.